Ajmal Khan, a British Muslim, is looking for his brother in Afghanistan. He wants to know why his brother came here and what happened to him. And he wants to take him home. Over the past few years, several Muslim families in England have had to come to terms with their sons going to fight for the Taliban. Saying goodbye to friends at the local mosque, Ajmal Khan, a 38-year-old property dealer, is going to find his brother Anwar, who left Burnley three years ago. Ajmal's learned from a journalist where he's being held as a prisoner of war, and he tells family friends that he's going to bring him home. You grew up with Anwar? My best mate. My best friend is uh, stuck in a bad hole now. We need to get him out. You know what I mean? So I feel sorry for him. He was a good kid, you know what I mean? At least he went in the wrong environment with the wrong people. Many of the mills which first attracted Asians to the northwest of England have closed. Ajmar tells me that drugs have taken their hold on the young unemployed and the town has been scarred by recent race riots. His brother was on heroin and crack cocaine and had a baby with an English girl. The family sent him back to Pakistan for a dose of traditional Muslim culture. But from there, he went to Afghanistan. The family were in despair when they heard. He'd been such a promising child. At the time, I think he was a quite fine child, except up until the age of, I would say, 13, 14, that's when he started uh, abusing, abusing drugs. Your father says he was the cleverest of the lot of you. It was quite sharp and witty, I, I agree, I agree. Ajmal says he's proud to be British and glad to have come here. But his brother, 13 years younger, felt differently. It is my view that some of, uh, quite uh, a lot of these uh, Muslim youths who are actually born in this country uh, have uh, divided loyalties. And one of the reasons why they have this is uh, primarily because they feel British, but they're not accepted as British. That in turn makes them vulnerable or indecisive in which direction to go. The people like the Taliban and other extremist organizations can easily take advantage of this, and they do. Ajmal is prepared to believe that his brother could have been an easy prey for the Taliban. But when he takes me to the family home in a more affluent area of town, he warns me that his parents take a very different view. That's my father. His father prefers to see his son as an innocent victim. Why did you send Anwar to Pakistan? Because he was going to be barred here, get mixed up with the drugs and this and that, and all the time, problem, problem, problem. So I sent him to be teach in a school, behavior and religious, that's it. I did not send him for this to go fight. Are you with me? So this is it. But he did a mistake. Because he, 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 he's British, he's born here. We got nothing to do with this. That their country, there. Maybe he's confused. He feels half well, I told Pakistani you, and half British. Brainwash, brainwash. Any generation, brainwash. Sometimes you understand what I mean. Everybody can make mistake. He realizes mistake now, aren't you? Preparing for his trip, Ajmal makes a call to the German reporter who was the last foreigner to see his brother. He'd taken this photo, which shocked the family. Anwar looks the committed Taliban warrior, and he looks ill. Uh, could I speak to Thomas, please? Thomas is Ajman. I suppose you've recognized me, Anwar Khan's brother. Yes. Th thank you very much for the photographs and the, and the card.
Tomas tells him how to get to the prison where he met Anwar. It's near Chayab in northern Afghanistan, where Anwar was captured by the Northern Alliance three years ago. Chayab, so what's the name, what's, what's the name of that commander? Mm-hmm. Bashir. Thomas had said earlier that Anwar is unlikely to survive the winter, which is why Ajmal decided to go. And so his condition is deteriorating rapidly. We've been hearing a lot of media reports and so on that a lot of these prisoners are being moved, uh, particularly the foreign prisoners, and they're being interrogated by the American Special Forces and thereafter being shifted to Cuba. Thank you very much for all your assistance thus far. And I will pass your regards on to Anwar. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, I guess that's it. It's difficult and it's tough. For Ajmal, who has young children, it's a daunting prospect, not least because of the weight of family expectation on his shoulders. Last time I went to Pakistan was about 20 years ago. I don't have uh, much family over there, uh, only a couple of uncles and uh, so some cousins and that. <laughs> so are you nervous, excited? I'm nervous, uh, not excited at all. Uh, I, you know, I'm scared. I'm scared for my own life and, uh, you know, as well as uh, uh, Anwar's life, but I can't imagine what will happen to my fa family if anything happened to me over there. Now you think about your father, you think about your brothers, your nieces and your nephews. What about your mother? Well, my mother doesn't know that I'm going to Afghanistan. She, she hasn't gone over uh, the arrest. She hasn't got over the arrest of Anwar and his captivity. Uh, she's had I think three strokes thus far, and she's developed an angina and various other heart pro problems, including diabetes, and currently she's in a hospital. And if she knew you were going to Afghanistan, how would she react? She, she would probably have a stroke. Do you think you'll get him out? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, this is just the beginning. The family assemble for a photo for Ajmal to take to his brother. Father, two of the five brothers in the family, and their various children. And Anwar's son, who was only a baby when his father left. I am to accompany Ajmal on his mission to Afghanistan. From Manchester, we'll fly to Islamabad in Pakistan. From Islamabad, Ajmal wants to visit the family village, Tajik, near Pakistan's northwest frontier province, not far from the border with Afghanistan. Ajma was born in Tajik, but hasn't wanted to come back since his last visit here as a teenager. But now he wants to retrace his brother's journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
He's shown the house where they expected Anwar to live for several months. But an uncle tells him he only stayed a few days. Uh, he used to sleep in this, uh, this room, but... But before he can deal with the present, he must pay his respects to the past. The family in Burnley wanted to expose the errant son to traditional family values where age is venerated and where the women in the family are kept hidden from prying eyes. The uncle's house is one of the biggest in the village. The older generation has done well. There's the family in Burnley, one uncle has a thriving business in Hong Kong, and the one who lives here is a teacher. He answers Ajmal's questions about what happened. Look, it was a mistake. He was walking at night and was lost, and then he ended up there. No. No, no, no. He was praying five times a day at the mosque and he was a very religious guy. He didn't even smoke cigarettes, let alone heroin. He never said anything. No, no, no. He never said anything. He just prayed. The students of the Hakania are going door to door and begging. They're not trained for fighting. They are poor people. They don't have much money. It could be that he went with friends who deceived him by saying they were just going sightseeing. He trusted them, but he was taken prisoner. The uncle clearly wants us to believe that Anwar was kidnapped and taken into Afghanistan against his will. He says that after a few weeks, someone phoned, demanding money for his release. Ajmal is keen to endorse this theory. It's a common practice among, you know, the, the, the Patans, and particularly the Patans from the frontier province, and including, you know, some tribes from the Afghanistan, to kidnap a rich kid and <laughs> then demand a ransom. So, about 200,000. Road about Oh. They asked for uh, around 200,000 rupees. That would be in, uh, in pounds, about uh, uh, 2,200 pounds, maybe 300 pounds. That isn't too much for a brother or a nephew. Do you consider paying me? How could we be sure? Who was going to guarantee everything? It was wartime. We were afraid to go. How could we get there? Although buying a prisoner's freedom is common enough here, this story does not sound plausible, but it's what the family want to believe. Meanwhile, a cousin appears with something Anwar left behind. That's uh, Anwar's passport. Looks like a homemade thing. Oh, it's, it's ripped and taped up. 
It confirms that Anwar entered Afghanistan illegally. Whether as kidnap victim or willing recruit, we still don't know. Right. Anwar would have known that the Hakania Madrasa, a religious school a short distance from the village, was already a notorious recruiting ground for the Taliban by the time he got here. Thomas, the German journalist, had said that Anwar went to Afghanistan via the madrasa. We call on the Mulana, Sami ul Haq, who has been arrested three times since September the 11th for inciting opposition to the war against terrorism. Ajmal shows him the photo of his brother. No, we have no knowledge of him. This school is on a main road and many people come in all the time. They pray and meet the students. He was a foreigner from England. He might have wanted to talk to the students about the Taliban at Afghanistan. It was a worldwide issue at the time. You don't deny that there is a pro-Taliban sentiment here in the madrasa? It's obvious that there was support from all religious forces in Pakistan, the mullahs, the madrasas and the people of Pakistan, as well as the Pakistani government itself. We also gave them moral support. We thought that these poor people were restoring peace. As far as I'm concerned, these poor Taliban were peaceful people and have never been involved in terrorism. But Ajmal still doesn't believe that his brother willingly joined the Taliban. It's time to move on. Ajmal wants to go to Afghanistan over land through the Khyber Pass, as his brother did. But we're warned that the road to Kabul is too dangerous. It's bandit country. We fly instead. It's been a few months since the Taliban were driven out of Kabul, and apart from the military presence, it gives the reassuring impression to Ajmal of being a normal, bustling Asian city. But there are underlying tensions. With the anti-Taliban government now in control, the Pakistanis and the Pushtun tribe from the border region who fought with the Taliban are now the enemy. And because he is Pushtun, Ajmal feels uncomfortable. I noticed that there are a lot of hostilities here towards the Pakistanis and the Pashtuns from whom the Taliban took birth. I certainly feel nervous. I have been tempted to speak uh, my own native language, which is Pushpa, on many occasions. No, give me five. But on the other hand, the fear led me to speak in English wherever I can. Ajmal wants to call at the Red Cross to ask whether they know about his brother. They're in contact with some 5,000 foreign prisoners in Afghanistan, about half the total number. How are you? Yes, how are you? Good, good. You look happy got an operation here. Yes. Michael Kleiner explains to Ajmal that although they know of his brother, they haven't been able to get to see him. After the September 11 events, uh, once we came back in the middle of November, we didn't have time yet to go up to the Takar province. The main objective for the moment was to visit the new detainees and the old detainees, if you want, those that were detained already before September 11th. We did not uh, consider them as priorities. Substantial sums of demands or of ransom has been made from the family via telephone calls and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is this a common practice? This is something that the ICRC office here in Kabul is getting lots of yes from families who are saying, I have been contacted because people have been requesting money from us to get our son back, our father back. And um, these are, we just have to tell them, look, we are not able to get involved in any of these dealings. Have you any idea what sort of figure they are asking for a prisoner? They, they are incredible figures running around. Such as? It will go up to $10,000, for example some as low as two, three thousand dollars. The meeting helps determine Ajmal's strategy. He's brought money with him and he's thinking of trying to buy his brother out. The next meeting is at the British Embassy. Ajmal says he doesn't want to come with me. After all, 
The British government has threatened to prosecute all British Taliban fighters on their return home. And anyway, he says, they've done nothing to help so far. I, I, I think there's an element of racism involved in this. I feel British, but I'm an Asian British. And I, I think uh, I'm regarded as a second-grade citizen. I feel that Anwar has been betrayed, neglected. Had Anwar been a member of a white family, the reaction from the British government would have been totally different. When I ask staff at the embassy about the British prisoners still being held in Afghanistan, they assure me that they regard the problem as a humanitarian one and they want to help get them out. They tell me they know of Anwar Khan, but that the journey north is logistically too difficult for them to go and visit him. That is the three-day journey now ahead of us. We set off somewhat nervously. We're warned that most of the areas outside Kabul are dangerous and we take an armed escort. And any trouble on the road, reporters? No, no, no trouble. It should be okay. okay. Everything is okay. Yes, I'm with you. Don't worry, be happy. Good, good. Let's go. At the end of the third day, we reach Chayab and the guest house owned by Commander Bashir Khan, whose authority extends to the prison holding Ajmal's brother. The morning brings bad news. The commander left town the previous day. Bashir Khan is the man Ajmal had been relying on and he's devastated. We find the commander's deputy, Dr. Junaid, who's doctor and town sheriff, trying to locate the commander on the radio. The news is even worse. The commander won't be back for four weeks. Ajmal is reluctant to tell the doctor why he's here, because he's been told that Commander Bashir is the only man he should deal with. Discreetly, we start to talk about the many foreign prisoners in the area. We used to have a lot of prisoners, about 200. General Fahim. Four days ago, on Thursday, General Fahim ordered us to release all the Afghan prisoners. We released 92 prisoners, but we're still holding 113 foreign prisoners. What type of conditions are they living in? They're given food. They don't do hard labor. They have guards for their protection. They have all the rights prisoners are entitled to. Ajmal wants to move things on. He's so near his brother now and doesn't want to wait for Commander Bashir to return. He asks the rest of us to keep out of the way while he negotiates directly with the doctor. That night he tells him that he is the brother of their British prisoner and he offers him a bribe. It goes horribly wrong. The doctor reacts angrily, and Ajmal thinks he's blown it. At the time I was uh, setting off for Afghanistan, my father told me, son, my next step could be in, in the grave. 
So whatever you are doing, do it as soon as possible. I don't want to let my parents down. I can, every step I take, I can see the tears of my father and my mother for Anwar. And so far as finding him is concerned, I don't know. I don't know what to expect. I mean, there were a lot of things which I didn't expect. And I've come across them. So I really don't know whether uh, I will find Anwar. The next day, the doctor sends us packing. Perhaps he was embarrassed to take a bribe which we were likely to hear of. More likely, Ajmal underestimated the feeling in this area of Afghanistan, which fought longest and hardest against the Taliban. The doctor spoke of his brother in scathing terms, accusing him of having links with al-Qaeda. He showed his dislike of Pushtuns by threatening to arrest Ajmal. We get back to the provincial capital of Talakan. Ajmal has had time to reflect on the doctor's anger. It is possible that he's uh, lost a family member, he's lost a friend to the pre previous regime. And I can understand where he's coming from. Do you believe the doctor's allegations against your brother? At the time, there were uh, a number of organizations operating in this country and it is possible that you know he Anwar was entrapped into various these organizations because I know how vulnerable Anwar was. Including Al Qaeda? Perhaps. Yes, I agree. He has made a mistake. I agree that he might have joined the Taliban. And I also agree that the Taliban might have forced him to do doing what he did. Ajmal now has to start all over again and decides to go through the official channels for help. He arranges to see the most senior commander in the region, Daoud Khan, who was in charge of the Northern Alliance forces who captured Anwar. In one of the attacks we launched on Kunduz, which was at night, we captured all Taliban positions in all directions. One position, which was manned by Anwar Khan and six other Pakistanis, put up resistance. But they were not familiar with that area, and the following day at 6 a.m., Anwar Khan and his friend Abdul Majid were taken prisoner at that place. Ajmal can no longer deny that his brother was a willing Taliban fighter. Can you ask the commander if Anwar offered any defense for his uh, criminal act? A number of young people from France, England, America, Pakistan, other Islamic countries and China fought alongside al-Qaeda against us. This was their crime. They came to our country and were involved in the aggression against us. We do not blame them. We consider the real culprits to be the leaders of al-Qaeda and those who recruited them, organized them and drew them into this. We're hoping for the position of foreign prisoners to be reviewed. They've spent sufficient time in jail, commensurate with their crimes, to be released. God willing, they will be released during the course of this year. From complete despair, there is a ray of hope. The commander gives permission for Ajmal to visit his brother. We set off on the eight-hour drive back to Chayab, but Ajmal's no closer to achieving his goal. Any release order must come from the defense minister, General Fahim, who happens to be in the UK. Growing in confidence now, Ajmal borrows our phone to appeal to the Afghan ambassador in London for help. Good morning, ambassador. I am in your beautiful country now. I only wish that the circumstances were different. Now that I'm here, I suppose I can beg you to ask General Fahim 
to kindly order the release of Anwar Khan so I can take him home back to my parents. We realize the terrible mistake that Anwar Khan has made. All I ask is for forgiveness. I myself together with all my family will appreciate this for the rest of our lives. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well? He says, don't worry about it. I'll sort it. Back in Chayab, the permission for the visit works. The doctor tells Ajmal that he can't go to the prison. Anwar will be brought here this morning. Did you see him? No, I don't. I don't. I don't. By midday, Ajmal's beginning to panic. Every vehicle that arrives at the guest house is closely scrutinized. His parents, too, have been waiting all day for news. Ajma prepares to disappoint them. Hello, Asalaamu Alaikum. Here is 7 o'clock uh, and we've been waiting since, well, it's nearly 8 o'clock now. Ajma, you can waiting. tell your parents he's here. Yeah, he's here, he's here now. Right, he's here. Anwar is being held in the doctor's office, which is also police headquarters. Having received orders from a higher authority, Dr. Junaid is now more accommodating. Thank you, thank you. She's also making you feel out. Ah, He's not my family. How may be we show Anwar the photos Ajmal took as he left home in Burnley, of his son and of the other children who've grown beyond recognition. Mama, that's Waji. No, that's uh, Tufail. Is that Tufail? Mm. Yeah. He's tall, man. Proper tall. <laughs> Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Ah. It's been three years since his parents last heard Anwar's voice. Oh, so Ah, Zakhim. Oh. Jude, ma. Oh. The pattern is a clash of Mukana. I jar, ma. Daga, the caca torque. Salaam Alaikum, caca sang, eh? خے <laughs> 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 Oh, sit, Miss Aida. Bill Kul Hoshal, his Mahapaki, his Malanidishu, John De Bas and Orhanem Bas. In fact, the doctor says later that he's got malaria and pneumonia. Now that he's caught up with the family, it's my turn to ask about him and the other foreign fighters. And how are the prisoners coping where you've left? Uh. They were right. I mean, they wasn't happy because they don't get visits, you see. You don't get visits. Um, the food's all right. The weather's good. It was all right. Just visits. Well, you've got a visitor now. Yeah. 
And you never got a single letter from him? No. Just once I got a letter from uh, the ICOC. But that was the last time I seen the ICOC. The Red Cross? Yeah. I got to a stage where, I mean, I didn't actually believe that anybody will be I mean, living anymore. I mean, I got to a stage where uh, I, mean, I blank out from the family, I think. You know, there's, I mean, there's just you and these four mountains <laughs> that they put you in between. I mean, they don't, I don't think they'll be living anymore because nobody's been to see you, and nobody's told you, no letters come. So, and what did you fight for the Taliban? Yeah. How did you get involved? Um, I mean, I wasn't behaving well in England. Uh, drug problems, uh, domestic problems, um, it, which led to that I couldn't work and couldn't, you know, uh, cooperate with friends and family, which led me to come to Pakistan. When I came to Pakistan, um, that's where I met the, the original Taliban, which sent the people to Afghanistan. Did you go through the Haqqaniya? Yeah, um, in our village we've got a madrasa called Qarilias Madrasa. Um, the Taliban used to come and go to the village whilst I was there. Uh, very strong Talibs. The young lads, very young lads. And so were you recruited from the Haqqaniya? No, I wasn't exactly. I mean, I went there, spent a few nights with them. And, um, and they were just happy because, you know, I was from England and they, like, surrounded me and, you know, they looked after me. Yeah. How did you get to Afghanistan? We set off about five, six people. I mean, I went to the madrasa early in the morning and then from there we set off. I was happy, you know, then. When I used to, when I, when I stepped into Afghanistan, I was happy. Because away from all the problems, you know, I allowed to do anything I want, you know, go and see new things. And with no intention to fight then. Just maybe to train and maybe just to, you know, walk around with a clashing cup on my shoulder. Maybe to, you know, learn how to fire getting a tank and I mean I learned Kalashnikov, the Seminov and uh, the Zakoyak which is an anti-aircraft gun. Uh, I fired the tank a few times. Then I travelled in Kabul and then I came back to Pakistan and then I, when, when I come back again then I came to Jalalabad. I bought clothes and you know it was, it was, it was just like a holiday thing. I didn't intend to go so far. Then when I came back to Kabul, then they were sending people to Kunduz. Come on, we'll go and see Kunduz then. We got to Kunduz one night, then the second night, about 11, 12 o'clock, they said, get up, you know, we got on the, the, the 4 by 4s took us straight to the front line. I mean, it went too far. It wasn't meant to go too far, it went too far. A lot of people got killed and, you know, it was difficult. And how much fighting were you involved in? I spent three days, three nights on the front line. Um, we, we didn't attack. I was on the defence lines. Um, the government, the Islamic government of Afghanistan, they attacked. Um, we moved back and then the elders vanished and everything went wrong from there. I mean, six of us got out alive. How many died? <clears throat> The rest all died. I mean, there was a lot of people, hundreds. And did you believe in the Taliban cause? Yeah, because uh, we was always told that there's Russia on the other side. So I didn't feel too bad, you know, standing on the defence line. And we couldn't actually see who was in the, in the, the trenches on the other side. You must have known a bit about Afghanistan before you went there and that the war with Russia was over. It was something to believe. I mean, it's a border. Anybody can cross. I mean, I came without a passport. And they told you the Russians are coming again? Yeah, they're saying they're coming with the weapons, supplying weapons, supplying food, helping, fighting themselves. You know. Do you believe the Taliban deliberately used the foreign fighters as, as cannon yeah. fodder, put them in the most dangerous positions? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I felt betrayed with the, the, the first night when the elders got themselves out and left us on the front lines. And they told them, I mean, they, they framed us. It was, it was all a frame-up. Ajma, now you've heard all this, what do you reckon? 
I, well, like you said, he is a kid from Burnley who is messed up with drugs, went out to get a, physical, uh, a bit of physical exercise to clean himself, clean himself up and ended up where he has ended up. And no doubt from what he has thus far said, you know, I'm sure if he hasn't put it in his own words, I'm sure and f from what I see of him, I think he regrets what he has done. Uh, you know. Do you? Of course I regret it. I regret it very deeply. Over the next few days, Anwar tells Ajmal in private that he was tortured in prison. Ajmal has raised his brother's expectations by being here, but the release order doesn't come. He feels he's let him down. We'll be setting, in a moment, we'll be setting off back to Kabul due to the fact that uh, we haven't received an Amir. As, uh, an Amir is a letter signed by General Fahim. But I suppose it hasn't happened. Been waiting impatiently. And since I've met Anwar, he keeps insisting that, uh, and he keeps saying, I suppose, he says, Take me home, I want to go home with you. I want to go home. He's waited five days before deciding to go back to Kabul to approach the authorities himself. He says goodbye to his brother, the moment he's been dreading. I'll go on to it. All right. later, Ajmal gets the release order, and the brothers from Burnley head home at last. But as they cross back into Pakistan, Anwar is arrested. Those who Pakistan once encouraged to go and fight for the Taliban are now the enemy. The Pakistani authorities say he'll be interrogated along with some 400 other former Taliban fighters and must await his turn. He could be in prison for months, even years. Sue Lloyd Roberts will be joined by Ajmal Khan from Pakistan live online tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. You can email your questions now at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash correspondent. Next week, he's been King of Morocco for nearly three years he promised a freer, more modern society. This woman thinks he's taking the wrong advice. These people marched to stop his reforms.
Now you think about your father, you think about your brothers, your nieces and your nephews. What about your mother? Well, my mother doesn't know that I'm going to Afghanistan. She she hasn't gone over uh, the arrest. She hasn't got over the arrest of Anwar and his captivity. Uh, she's had, I think, three strokes thus far, and she's developed an angina and various other heart pro problems, including diabetes. And currently, she's in a hospital. And if she knew you were going to Afghanistan, how would she react? She she would probably have a stroke. Do you think you get him out? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, this is just the beginning. The family assemble for a photo for Ajmal to take to his brother. Father, two of the five brothers in the family, and their various children. And Anwar's son, who was only a baby when his father left. I am to accompany Ajmal on his mission to Afghanistan. From Manchester, we'll fly to Islamabad in Pakistan. From Islamabad, Ajmal wants to visit the family village, Tajik, near Pakistan's northwest frontier province, not far from the border with Afghanistan. Ajmal was born in Tajik, but hasn't wanted to come back since his last visit here as a teenager. But now he wants to retrace his brother's journey. He's shown the house where they expected Anwar to live for several months. But an uncle tells him he only stayed a few days. Uh, he used to sleep in this, uh, this room, but... But before he can deal with the present, he must pay his respects to the past. A week later, Ajmal gets the release order and the brothers from Burnley head home at last. But as they cross back into Pakistan, Anwar is arrested. Those who Pakistan once encouraged to go and fight for the Taliban are now the enemy. The Pakistani authorities say he'll be interrogated along with some 400 other former Taliban fighters and must await his turn. He could be in prison for months, even years. Sue Lloyd Roberts will be joined by Ajmal Khan from Pakistan live online tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. You can email your questions now at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash correspondent. Next week, he's been king of Morocco for nearly three years. He promised a freer, more modern society. This woman thinks he's taking the wrong advice. These people marched to stop his reforms.
They tell me they know of Anwar Khan, but that the journey north is logistically too difficult for them to go and visit him. That is the three-day journey now ahead of us. We set off, somewhat nervously. We're warned that most of the areas outside Kabul are dangerous, and we take an armed escort. And any trouble on the road reported? No, no, no trouble. It should be okay. okay. Everything is okay. Yes, I'm with you. Don't worry, be happy. Good, good. Let's go. At the end of the third day, we reach Chayab and the guest house owned by Commander Bashir Khan, whose authority extends to the prison holding Ajmal's brother. The morning brings bad news. The commander left town the previous day. Bashir Khan is the man Ajmal had been relying on and he's devastated. We find the commander's deputy, Dr. Junaid, who's doctor and town sheriff, trying to locate the commander on the radio. The news is even worse. The commander won't be back for four weeks. Ajmal is reluctant to tell the doctor why he's here, because he's been told that Commander Bashir is the only man he should deal with. Discreetly, we start to talk about the many foreign prisoners in the area. We used to have a lot of prisoners, about 200. General Fahim. Four days ago, on Thursday, General Fahim ordered us to release all the Afghan prisoners. We released 92 prisoners, but we're still... How could we be sure? Who was going to guarantee everything? It was wartime. We were afraid to go. How could we get there? Although buying a prisoner's freedom is common enough here, this story does not sound plausible. But it's what the family want to believe. Meanwhile, a cousin appears with something Anwar left behind. That's uh, Anwar's passport. Looks like a homemade thing. Oh, it's, it's ripped and taped up. It confirms that Anwar entered Afghanistan illegally. Whether as kidnap victim or willing recruit, we still don't know. Right. Anwar would have known that the Hakania Madrasa, a religious school a short distance from the village, was already a notorious recruiting ground for the Taliban by the time he got here. Thomas, the German journalist, had said that Anwar went to Afghanistan via the Madrasa. We call on the Mulana, Sami ul Haq, who has been arrested three times since September the 11th for inciting opposition to the war against terrorism. Ajmal shows him the photo of his brother. No, we have no knowledge of him. This school is on a main road and many people come in all the time. They pray and meet the students. He was a foreigner from England. He might have wanted to talk to the students about the Taliban at Afghanistan. It was a worldwide issue at the time. You don't deny that there is a pro-Taliban sentiment here in the madrasa? 
It's obvious that there was support from all religious forces in Pakistan, the mullahs, the madrasas and the people of Pakistan, as well as the Pakistani government itself. We also gave them moral support. We thought that these poor people were restoring peace. As far as I'm concerned, these poor Taliban were peaceful people and have never been involved in terrorism. But Ajmal still doesn't believe that his brother willingly joined the Taliban. It's time to move on. Ajmal wants to go to Afghanistan over land through the Khyber Pass, as his brother did. But we're warned that the road to Kabul is too dangerous. It's bandit country. We fly instead. It's been a few months since the Taliban were driven out of Kabul, and apart from the military presence, it gives the reassuring impression to, to go up to the Takar province. The main objective for the moment was to visit the new detainees and the old detainees, if you want, those that were detained already before September 11th. We did not uh, consider them as priorities. Substantial sums of demands or of ransom has been made from the family via telephone calls and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is this a common practice? This is something that the ICRC office here in Kabul is getting lots of yes from families who are saying, I have been contacted because people have been requesting money from us to get our son back, our father back. And um, these are, we just have to tell them, look, we are not able to get involved in any of these dealings. Have you any idea what sort of figure they are asking for a prisoner? They, they are incredible figures running around. Such as? It will go up to $10,000, for example some as low as two, three thousand dollars. The meeting helps determine Ajmal's strategy. He's brought money with him and he's thinking of trying to buy his brother out. The next meeting is at the British Embassy. Ajmal says he doesn't want to come with me. After all, the British government has threatened to prosecute all British Taliban fighters on their return home. And anyway, he says, they've done nothing to help so far. I, I, I think there's an element of racism involved in this. I feel British, but I'm an Asian British. And I, I think uh, I'm regarded as a second grade citizen. I feel that Anwar has been betrayed, neglected. Had Anwar been a member of a white family, the reaction from the British government would have been totally different. When I ask staff at the embassy about the British prisoners still being held in Afghanistan, they assure me that they regard the problem as a humanitarian one and they want to help get them out. They tell me they know of Anwar Khan, but that the journey north is logistically too difficult for them to go and visit him. That is the three-day journey now ahead of us. We set off, somewhat nervously. We're warned that most of the areas outside Kabul are dangerous, and we take an armed escort. And any trouble on the road, reporters? No, no, not trouble. It no. should be OK. But everything is OK. Yes, I'm with you. Don't worry, be happy. Good, good. Let's go. It could be that he went with friends who deceived him by saying they were just going sightseeing. He trusted them, but he was taken prisoner. The uncle clearly wants us to believe that Anwar was kidnapped and taken into Afghanistan against his will. He says that after a few weeks, someone phoned, demanding money for his release. Ajmal is keen to endorse this theory. It's a common practice among, you know, the, the, the Patans and particularly the Patans from the frontier province and including, you know, some tribes from the Afghanistan to kidnap a rich kid and hmm. then demand a ransom. So, Kimatsul, Suvi, Lak, Tolaka, Trilaka. About 200,000. Road about Tolaka. They asked for 
around 200,000 rupees. That would be in, uh, in pounds about uh, uh, 2,200 pounds, maybe 300 pounds. That isn't too much for a brother or a nephew. Do you consider paying it? How could we be sure? Who was going to guarantee everything? It was wartime. We were afraid to go. How could we get there? Although buying a prisoner's freedom is common enough here, this story does not sound plausible, but it's what the family want to believe. Meanwhile, a cousin appears with something Anwar left behind. That's uh, Anwar's passport. Looks like a homemade thing. It's, it's ripped and taped up. It confirms that Anwar entered Afghanistan illegally, whether as kidnap victim or willing recruit, we still don't know. Right. Anwar would have known that the Hakania Madrasa, a religious school a short distance from the village, was already a notorious recruiting ground for the Taliban by the time he got here. Thomas, the German journalist, had said that Anwar went to Afghanistan via the madrasa. We call on the Mulana, Sami ul Haq, who has been arrested three times since September the 11th for inciting opposition to the war against terrorism. Ajmar shows him the photo of his brother. No, we have no knowledge of him. This school is on a main road and many people come in all the time. They pray and meet the students. He was a foreigner from England. He might have won. We set off, somewhat nervously. We're warned that most of the areas outside Kabul are dangerous and we take an armed escort. And any trouble on the road, reporters? No, no, no trouble. It should be OK. OK. Everything is OK. Yes, I'm with you. Don't worry, be happy. Good, good. Let's go. At the end of the third day, we reach Chayab and the guest house owned by Commander Bashir Khan, whose authority extends to the prison holding Ajmal's brother. The morning brings bad news. The commander left town the previous day. Bashir Khan is the man Ajmal had been relying on and he's devastated. We find the commander's deputy, Dr. Junaid, who's doctor and town sheriff, trying to locate the commander on the radio. The news is even worse. The commander won't be back for four weeks. Ajmal is reluctant to tell the doctor why he's here, because he's been told that Commander Bashir is the only man he should deal with. Discreetly, we start to talk about the many foreign prisoners in the area. We used to have a lot of prisoners, about 200. General Fahim. Four days ago, on Thursday, General Fahim ordered us to release all the Afghan prisoners. We released 92 prisoners, but we're still holding 113 foreign prisoners. What type of conditions are they living in? They're given food. They don't do hard labor. They have guards for their protection. 
They have all the rights, prisoners. And no doubt from what he has thus far said, you know, I'm sure, if he hasn't put it in his own words, I'm sure, and from what I see of him, I think he regrets what he has done. Uh, you know. Do you? Of course I regret it. I regret it very deeply. Over the next few days, Anwar tells Ajmal in private that he was tortured in prison. Ajmal has raised his brother's expectations by being here, but the release order doesn't come. He feels he's let him down. We'll be setting, in a moment, we'll be setting off back to Kabul due to the fact that uh, we haven't received an Amir. As, uh, an Amir is a letter signed by General Fahim. But I suppose it hasn't happened. Been waiting impatiently. And since I've met Anwar, he keeps insisting that, uh, and he keeps saying, I suppose, he says, Take me home, I want to go home with you. I want to go home. He's waited five days before deciding to go back to Kabul to approach the authorities himself. He says goodbye to his brother, the moment he's been dreading. Don't worry, I'll go on to it. I sort it. All right. A week later, Ajmal gets the release order, and the brothers from Burnley head home at last. But as they cross back into Pakistan, Anwar is arrested. Those who Pakistan once encouraged to go and fight for the Taliban are now the enemy. The Pakistani authorities say he'll be interrogated along with some 400 other former Taliban fighters and must await his turn. Michael Kleiner explains to Ajmal that although they know of his brother, they haven't been able to get to see him. In, uh, after the September 11 events, uh, once we came back in the middle of November, we didn't have time yet to go up to the Taka province. The main objective for the moment was to visit the new detainees and the old detainees, if you want, those that were detained already before September 11th, we did not uh, consider them as priorities. Substantial sums of demands or of ransom has been made from the family via telephone calls and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is this a common practice? This is something that the ICRC office here in Kabul is getting lots of yes from families who are saying, I have been contacted because people have been requesting money from us to get our son back, our father back. And um, these are, we just have to tell them, look, we are not able to get involved in any of these dealings. Have you any idea what sort of figure they are asking for a prisoner? They, they are incredible figures running around. Such as? It will go up to $10,000, for example, some as low as two, three thousand dollars $3,000. The meeting helps determine Ajmal's strategy. He's brought money with him, and he's thinking of trying to buy his brother out. The next meeting is at the British Embassy. Ajmal says he doesn't want to come with me. After all, the British government has threatened to prosecute all British Taliban fighters on their return home. And anyway, he says, they've done nothing to help so far. I, I, I think there's an element of racism involved in this. I feel British, but I'm an Asian British. And I, I think uh, I'm regarded as a second grade citizen. I feel that Anwar has been betrayed, neglected. Had Anwar been a member of a white family, 
the reaction from the British government would have been totally different. When I ask staff at the embassy about the British prisoners still being held in Afghanistan, they assure me that they regard the problem as a humanitarian one and they want to help get them out. They tell me they know of Anwar Khan, but that the journey north is logistically too difficult for them to go and visit him. That is the three-day journey now ahead of us. We set off somewhat nervously. We're warned that most of the areas outside Kabul are dangerous and we take an armed escort. And any trouble on the road, reporters? No, no, no trouble. It should road. be okay. okay. Everything is okay. Yes, I'm with you. Don't worry, be happy. Good, good. Let's go. Off back to Kabul. Due to the fact that uh, we haven't received an Amir. As an Amir is a letter signed by General Fahim. But well, I suppose it hasn't happened. Been waiting impatiently. And since I've met Anwar, he keeps insisting that, I, and he keeps saying, I suppose, he says, take me home, I wanna go home with you. I wanna go home. He's waited five days before deciding to go back to Kabul to approach the authorities himself. He says goodbye to his brother, the moment he's been dreading. A week later, Ajmal gets the release order, and the brothers from Burnley head home at last. But as they cross back into Pakistan, Anwar is arrested. Those who Pakistan once encouraged to go and fight for the Taliban are now the enemy. The Pakistani authorities say he'll be interrogated along with some 400 other former Taliban fighters and must await his turn. He could be in prison for months, even years. Sue Lloyd Roberts will be joined by Ajmal Khan from Pakistan, live online tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. You can email your questions now at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash correspondent. Next week, he's been king of Morocco for nearly three years he promised a freer, more modern society. This woman thinks he's taking the wrong advice. These people marched to stop his reforms.